Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining me again. Today, I'm really excited to read to you a story called Snow Devils, a Riley Mack story by Chris Grabenstein. It is the first story in Chris Grabenstein's super puzzle-tastic mysteries, short stories for young sleuths from Mystery Writers of America. So each story in this collection, this anthology, is a mystery story that provides clues within the story itself. So if you're paying attention, you should be able to figure out with the character or even before the characters, who did whatever, who did the mystery that they're trying to solve. And to see if you got it right, all you have to do is check my next video, which if you're in my playlist, it's the one directly below this one. If you're not, just look up the title of the story. So this one's gonna be Snow Devils and Solution. So it'll be Snow Devil Solution. And you can check if you're right, if you pick the right person, you got the culprit. Um, and then you can tell me about it because I wanna know if you got it. I think they're kind of hard. I haven't really solved any of them. So don't feel bad if you don't. Um, I'm recommending this, every story in this book to start with third grade, but not because of any like content maturity warnings or anything like that. It's just, it's got some higher level vocabulary and stuff like that, but it's going to be great practice. So if there's a younger student, someone younger than third grade that wants to try their hand at mystery solving, it might be a little hard, but you can always try it. Any reading's good reading. So I'm going to go ahead and start. This is Snow Devils, a Riley Mack story by Chris Grabenstein. The fart was huge. Really good beginning. I know we're off to a good start already. So the fart was huge. The biggest one Riley Mack had ever seen. Looks like somebody enjoyed their snow day yesterday. Riley said to himself with a grin. The towering word had been carefully shuffled into the deep snow on a hill facing the school library windows. Each letter was at least 20 feet tall and surrounded by the daintier boot prints of the mystery writer, moving from one leg plowed letter to the next. The F-A-R-T spanned at least 40 feet across the backyard of a house on the other side of the school's perimeter fence. Mr. Ball's not going to like that, said Riley's friend, Ben Markowitz, who was sitting with him at a table in the library that more or less served as Riley's office. Mr. Ball was Fairview Middle School's vice principal. It's disciplinarian. The guy who liked nothing better than running detention hall. He'd strut up and down the rows of chairs tapping a ruler behind his back, eyes darting from one inmate to the next, just itching to whip out his pink pad and give one of the troublemakers another hour in the after-school punishment cell. Troublemakers. That's what some grown-ups called Riley and his friends, Ben, Brianna, Jamal, and Mongo, whose real name was Hubert Montgomery. But because he was so huge, everybody called him Hugh Mongo which quickly morphed into Mongo. In truth, Riley's crew didn't make trouble. They were fixers, the school's go-to team of Robin Hoods. They only tried to right wrongs, protect innocent kids from bullies, look out for abused animals, and basically use their talents to do all the good they could. Riley had a strict ethical code for his team's operations too. They would never execute a caper that was just plain wrong. For instance, on Monday, an eighth grader named Steve Duffy had come to Riley's office in the media center, begging for help. What do you need? Riley asked. Answers to my history makeup quiz. Excuse me? I missed the quiz last week. So Mrs. Henkin is gonna give me a makeup exam Thursday morning with all new questions and I'll be on my own. Jenny Myers won't be sitting next to me. Riley arched an inquisitive eyebrow. She's smart, Duffy explained. Always knows what, to an what answer to circle. I sometimes copy her moves. I see, said Riley. 
but I don't need Jenny Myers. I saw where Mrs. Henkin stashed the answer key. Oh, you did, did you? Top right hand drawer of her desk, the one that locks. I figured your guy Jamal could sneak in after school, pop it open, copy the answers and boom, I'm golden. But we have to hurry. Like I said, my makeup test is first thing Thursday. Nope, Riley told the eighth grader, not gonna do it. Why, what's your problem? I can pay you $10, 20, okay, 30. That's not how we roll, Steve. Why not? Because I might need brain surgery someday. What? You think I wanna be operated on by some Dr. Dingus D. Doofus who cheated his way through middle school, then high school and all the way through medical school? Oh, fumes Steve, funny. Guess Brandon Kilmeade was right. He said you and your crew were yesterday's news. He'd do the same job for 20 bucks. But I came to you first, Riley Mac, out of respect. Steve? Yeah? Why don't you study for the test? You say it's not till Thursday. Today's Monday. You have three whole days. Um, no, I don't. Every single one of my after school hours this week is spoken for. I made it to the next level of alien annihilator. I can't miss a single online thrash or my avatar will lose his force field and his bludgeon blue. Riley shook his head in disbelief, remembering that Monday morning conversation. So Ben, he asked his friend, who do you think's the prime suspect for the fart art? I'd go with Sam Morkel Williams, said Ben, tapping the glass of his smartphone, pulling up a database. Kid's a real cut up and class clown. This looks like his kind of prank. You have to admire his craftsmanship, said Riley. It's not easy bulldozing letters and just know while making the minimum number of moves necessary to hop over to the next letter. Ben nodded. The leap from the right leg of the A to the left leg of the R is amazing. A Winter Olympics caliber stuff. Kudos to Sam. Ben was the brainiac in Riley's crew. He used words like kudos a lot. OMG, you guys! Brianna Bloomfield made a dramatic entrance into the library. She was their actress. She could imitate voices, create disguises, and become whoever Riley and his team needed her to be. Her locker was full of costumes, hats, wigs, makeup kits, and all sorts of disguises. She was so theatrical that almost every entrance she made was dramatic. Did you guys see it, the part? We're kind of looking at it right now, said Riley. Brianna gasped. That thing is huge. No, it's ginormous. Who do you think did it? Sam Morkel Williams, said Ben. That's what I thought, said Brianna. Although it could have been Alyssa Shapiro, that girl's hardcore. Interesting choices, said Riley. Any idea whose yard that is? Old man Jenkins said Brianna. I mean, old man probably isn't his real first name, but that's what everybody calls him. Is he old? Said Ben innocently. Brianna rolled her eyes. Oh, yeah. He's also a widower. Doesn't really like kids. You do not want your ball to end up in his backyard. If it does, you'll never see it again. They say the inside of his garage looks like a sporting goods store. Jamal Wilson came strutting into the library. He was the youngest and newest member of Riley's Nat Pack. That's what Fairview's sheriff, Big John Brown, called Riley Mack and the other known troublemakers he associated with. The sheriff thought they were a bunch of annoying little pests, probably because the bully they busted most often was his son, Gavin Brown. Riley didn't mind the Nat Pack label. In fact, he kind of liked it. Gnats were small, almost microscopic creatures, but they could drive full-grown adults crazy. Dog, said Jamal, that fart out there is elephantine. You know what that word means, Riley Mac? Yeah, big. Jamal was good with his hands and could crack open just about any lock you tossed his way. He also liked memorizing big words out of the dictionary. It's positively beamothic, Jamal continued. Man, 
I wish I'd thought to write something in the snow yesterday. I know so many better words than fart. For instance, flatulence. You know what that word means? Yeah, said Riley. Farts. Correct. But I spent the whole day yesterday sledding with Mongo over the golf, golf course. Let me tell you, that dude is strong. He gave me such a mighty shove downhill, I was flying. Hey, speaking of Mongo, has anybody seen him this morning? Asked Riley. Everybody shook their heads. Mongo was the group's muscle. Sure, he was a seventh grader, but he was growing so fast that he was already bigger than most high school kids. Maybe he's in the cafeteria, suggested Ben. He sometimes needs a second breakfast. And a third, said Brianna. Riley and his crew usually met up in the library every morning before the first bell. After school, they'd meet up again at the Pizza Palace on Main Street. They were a little like firefighters or the Avengers. They were always ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. Excuse me, guys, said the librarian. The first bell is about to ring and I'm gonna need these tables. Mrs. Henkin is still snowed in, so she asked me to give a makeup quiz for her. Riley nodded. He figured Steve Duffy's private history quiz had slid back a day on account of yesterday's snow. No problem, he said to the librarian. Come on, guys. Riley and his crew stood up from the table. Enjoy the view, cracked Jamal, nodding his head toward the big fart outside the window. Oh my, gasped the librarian. Who did that? That, said Ben, is today's $64,000 question. Riley led his crew out of the library. Dag, said Jamal when they were out in the hall. There's a reward? $64,000 for finding a fart felon? It's just an expression, Jamal, said Brianna. It was the title of an old TV game show back in the 1950s. Now, explained Ben, whatever a question is extremely important or difficult to answer, we call it a $64,000 question. Really, said Jamal. I mean, y'all might do that, but not me. I'd call that question onerous or troublesome, maybe even enigmatic. You know what those words mean? Yeah, said Riley. It won't be easy for Mr. Ball to figure out who wrote fart in the snow. Mr. Ball thinks I did it, said Mongo. On his way to his first period class, Riley had seen his friend Mongo, the gentle giant, sitting in his stocking feet on the bench outside of the school's main office. He told me to wait right here while he investigated. So that's what I'm doing, waiting right here. Why aren't you wearing any shoes? Asked Riley, sitting down on the bench alongside his friend. Mongo wiggled his toes. His brown socks were decorated with cute little teddy bears. Not that anyone at Fairview Middle School would dare make fun of him for it. Mr. Ball took my boots, he explained. Why? He wants to go see if they match the boot prints near that big fart in Old Man Jenkins' backyard. He thinks you did that? Yeah. But you were at the golf course yesterday, sledding with Jamal. I know. I told Mr. Ball he didn't care. He said I was a miscreant and a ne'er-do-well. The big guy furrowed his brow and scrunched up his eye. Riley could tell he was thinking. Hard. Hey, Riley? Yeah, Mongo? What's a miscreant and ne'er-do-well? Riley winked. They're both very important members of any top-notch snack pack. Oh, cool. Mr. Ball came through the front doors wrapped in a dull gray parka that made him look like a quilted pork sausage. He stomped snow off his rubber boots, shook it off his pant cuffs. Then he wiggle waggled the large pair of tan hiking boots he held in his hand. If the boot fits, Mr. Montgomery, he said with a sneer as he marched over to the bench, wear it. Okay, said Mongo. Thanks, my toes were getting kind of cold. What are you doing here, Mr. Mack? Sitting. Shouldn't you be on your way to class? No, sir. Not when one of my best friends is shoeless and the real field temperature outside is 15. 
Your friend, as you put it, Mr. Mac, is not wearing shoes because he was wearing boots. These boots, the ones I hereby hold in my hands. But now they are more than boots, Mr. Montgomery. They are evidence. Mongo nodded. Okay, but can I still wear them? No, not until you confess. To what? Writing that foul word in the snow. Oh, I didn't do that. Oh, yes, you did. You're the only student at Fairview Middle School who wears a size 15 shoe or boot. How can you know that? Asked Riley. Because I keep statistics, Mr. Mack. Why? For situations like this one. Plus, Mr. Montgomery, these are Timberland brand boots. They leave an extremely distinctive, easy to identify footprint pattern in the snow. The same pattern I found at the scene of the crime. Wait a second, said Riley. Timberland boots are very popular. And who said a student from Fairview wrote that word in the snow? Some adults with size 15 feet could have, ha! Don't make me laugh, Mr. Mack. Ha, ha, ha. Look at me, I'm laughing. I warned you not to make me do that. Brianna came up the hall, hugging her books to her chest, trying to blend into the background of lockers. Riley touched his ear. She nodded and moved to the nearby water fountain where she could eavesdrop. Riley stood up. I can prove Mongo, I mean Hubert, didn't do it. Mr. Ball gave Riley some snide stink eye. Oh, really? How? I'm not exactly sure, said Riley but you definitely don't want to accuse the wrong student. Remember what the new school superintendent said about false accusations and lawsuits? Mrs. Worthington said something about lawsuits. Suddenly, Mr. Ball's left eye was twitching. She's a very important person, he stuttered. We haven't met, not yet, but well, I, of course, respect her opinions. Brianna touched the tip of her nose and slipped around the corner where right on cue, she speed dialed Mr. Ball. The phone inside the chest pocket of his sausage parka started chirping. Ben had loaded all the personal cell phone numbers of the, of the teachers and administrators in Brianna and Riley's phones for just such an emergency. He'd also blocked the caller ID function. Hello, Mr. Ball snapped into his phone. This is Albert Ball. To whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? His eyes went wide. Superintendent Worthington? Why, I was just talking about you. I loved your most recent memo. Riley grinned. Brianna was on the case. I see, said Mr. Ball. You're writing a new memo about avoiding lawsuits? Fascinating. Oh, I agree, Mrs. Worthington. False accusations are the worst. However, I think if you have solid evidence and a prime suspect. Right, lawsuit. Need to be 100% certain. What? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do have a student eager to lead an investigation, but, oh, you think that's a good idea? You know, now that you mention it, so do I. Thank you, Mrs. Worthington. And if you have a minute, might we discuss the current pay scale for vice principals in the district? As you may not know, oh, I see you have to run. No, later would be fine. We'll, we'll chat later. Thank you for the call. Mr. Ball tapped the off button on his phone just as the second class change bell rang. You have until the end of the day, Mr. Mack. Otherwise, I'm turning Mr. Montgomery over to the authorities. Thank you, sir, said Riley. May I have my boots back, Mr. Ball? Asked Mongo. No, you may not. I'm confiscating them. Huh? I'm keeping them. They're evidence. They're also warm, sir. Warmer than just socks. For goodness sakes, Hubert, go to the gym. Put on your sneakers. Good idea, sir, said Riley, grabbing Mongo by the elbow. Let's hit the gym. As they walked, Riley thumbed a text string. Bathroom emergency. Now, meet us outside the boys' locker room. Riley and Mongo hit the gym. Mongo went to his locker and quickly sit, slid on his size 15 sneakers. These won't be good for walking home in the snow. Don't worry, Mongo, Riley reassured him. You'll have your Timberlands back before school is out for the day. When they stepped into the hall outside the locker room, Ben, Brianna, and Jamal were there, waiting for them. 
why, hello, Mr. Mac, said Brianna in a snooty, lockjawed voice, like she went to college in Connecticut. I'm ever so delighted to see you again. Is that the voice you used on Mr. Ball? asked Mongo. Yeah, I went full blown Ivy League. It can be very intimidating. Good job, said Riley. Thank you, said Brianna in her normal voice. An actor makes choices. The secret is believing in those choices, keeping them real. Yo, said Jamal. That was supposed to sound real because if I may, I have a few notes on your performance that I'd be happy to. Not now, guys, said Riley. The clock's ticking. Ben nodded and waved a green card. I could only score a five minute bathroom pass. Me too, said Jamal. Okay, said Riley. We have to clear Mongo. I didn't do it, said Mongo. Cool, said Jamal. So uh, what exactly are people saying you did? Mr. Ball thinks I'm the one who wrote fart in the snow. Nah, man, that's not your style. You're more physical than verbal. Me, I'm something of a wordsmith. Love to play with words, experiment with them. Jamal, said Riley, we only have until the end of the school day. So far, the evidence about, against Mongo is pretty solid. The snow writing was done by somebody wearing size 15 Timberland boots. Like Mongo wears, said Ben. Exactly, we don't have the time to pull together a full blown operation. We need to peanut butter out the tasks and see what we can learn about the other suspects. Um, what other suspects? Asked Ben. Well, you mentioned Sam Morkel Williams, class clown, known prankster. You and Jamal get close to him at lunch. If Sam did it, he's gonna be eager for someone to find out. The guy lives for the spotlight, right? Brianna. Yeah? This Alyssa Shapiro you mentioned. Nuh-uh, no way. I told you she's hardcore. I think she has tattoos. I know she dyes her hair. That's why it's so black, it looks bluish. The girl is extremely goth. She'll be giving me noogies in the cafeteria floor if I even come close to her table. Goth chicks don't like drama geeks. Then put on a disguise, become somebody new, maybe a new kid. Pretend this is your first day at Fairview. You're looking for girls even gothier than you are. Brianna nodded, slowly. Okay. Yes, I can do this. I am an actor. Sure, it would be a challenge, but all good roles are. What do we do, Riley? Asked Mongo, you and me. You stick to your class schedule and be on your best behavior. Me, I'm gonna visit old man Jenkins after lunch. I have a free period. No, Riley, said Ben. That man is old and cranky, said Jamal. They could call him old cranky man Jenkins. He might come after you with his weed whacker. Brianna arched an eyebrow. In the middle of winter? Hey, some old dudes keep their weed whackers handy all year long just to chase kids off their lawns. And who knows what else he might have hidden in that garage. Sludge hammer, hedge trimmers, WD-40 he could spray in your eyeballs. Riley just grinned. He might also have a pair of Timberland boots, size 15. Riley and his crew had lunch at the same time. Usually they sat together and fielded requests from kids who needed help writing wrongs. Today, they split up. Ben and Jamal sat with Sam Morkel Williams and his friends who called themselves the Goofballs. They were Fairview Middle School's premier practical jokers and class clowns, the best of the best. Brianna would hit the locker room, changed into her new goth girl disguise costume, and then try to find a seat at Alyssa Shapiro's table. It shouldn't be hard. Nobody much wanted to sit with Alyssa except her nose and eyebrow studded friend with purple hair, Charlotte Edelman. Mongo and Riley ate their lunches at their regular table. See, said the weaselly looking kid, Brandon Kilmeade. He and Steve Duffy shuffled past Mongo and Riley's table, carrying trays loaded down with double desserts and double chocolate milks. Riley Mac is old news. He can't even protect his pal, Mongo. Check out the shoes. Ha, laughed Steve. He's wearing canvas high tops the day after a snowstorm. His socks are gonna stink when he gets home. Brandon nodded. His feet are gonna itch too. 
Mongo slammed down both fists on the table and jangled all the silverware. My boots have been confiscated for evidence, he declared. We heard, said Brandon. If you need help getting out of that jam, let me know. I charge by the job, not the hour. Hey, Riley, taunted Steve. Guess who aced his history quiz this morning? Me, answered all four questions correctly. Scored a big fat 100. Meanwhile, over at the goofballs table, Jamal and Ben were listening to Sam Morkel Williams, regaling his fellow jokers with his funny tale of woe. Aw oh, man, I so wish I'd thought of that, he said. Writing something funny in the snow was like the ultimate stunt. Although I might've gone with the word poop. Poop is always funnier than fart. Underpants would have been funny too. Y'all talk about this kind of stuff every day, asked Jamal. Nah, said Sam. Usually we tell jokes and just try to make everybody else laugh so hard milk comes shooting out of their nose. Cool, said Jamal. Nice grabbing lunch with you dudes. We gotta run. Yeah, said Ben. This was fun. And you know, funny. Sorry, I didn't laugh much. It's nothing personal, said Jamal. Ben never laughs, except when he is watching that British guy, Mr. Bean. Go figure, huh? As Ben and Jamal took their trays to the drop-off window, they passed Brianna in a jet black wig. She was dressed in black from head to toe. Even her lipstick was black. She had raccoon circles around her eyes, wore a jagged necklace, and had plastered all sorts of temporary tattoos up and down her sleeveless arms. She sat down at the table where Alyssa and Charlotte were sitting, each girl twirling the tips of her dyed hair. All Brianna had on her tray was a small plate cradling a wobbly hard-boiled egg. And the other girls were eating bowls of gloomy looking gruel or grits. It could have been a grit. Hey, said Brianna, sounding totally bored. Hey, said Alyssa. Charlotte just grunted. I knew, said Brianna with a yawn. First day. Cool, said Alyssa. Charlotte grunted again. So, said Brianna, which one of you total bad apples wrote the word in like, the snow. Alyssa and Charlotte put down their spoons and glared at her. You think I wrote fart, said Alyssa. In the snow? She sounded like she might rip somebody's hair out sometime soon. Totally, said Brianna. You don't wear coffin creeper boots like this in the snow, idiot, snarled Alyssa. They cost like a hundred and thirty dollars added Charlotte. Snow could ruin the leather, said Alyssa. And do you know how much we paid for these pants? Oh, okay, said Brianna. Good fashion tips, thanks. She picked up her tray, turned around, looked over to where Riley was sitting, shook her head and mouthed two words. No way. That meant it was up to Riley. He had to sneak over to old man Jenkins's house and see what he could see. He had a free period right after lunch that he usually spent in the media center working on independent studies. Excuse me, he said to the librarian. I need to go outside and gather some samples for science class. Samples, the librarian asked skeptically. Yeah, said Riley. I'm going to catalog snowflakes. See if they're all really different. I mean, come on, one or two have to be the same, am I right? The librarian stared at him for a full second. Be sure to wear your coat. Yes, ma'am. Riley put on his snow boots and coat and trudged across the ball fields to the scene of the crime. The edges of the fart letters were crusting over with ice. Riley wondered why Mr. Ball hadn't sent the custodians to plow away or cover up the word, probably because it was on old man Jenkins's property, not the school's. Riley scooched through a hole he knew about in the fence and carefully headed toward Mr. Jenkins's elevated back porch. It was made of concrete and free of snow, shielded by an angled aluminum awning overhead. 
As he moved closer, Riley could see the tops of a pair of tan boots peeking out of a wooden crate pushed into a corner where the porch's railing met the house's brick wall. Riley tiptoed up the stoop three steps and took a look inside the boots. He checked out their size. It was printed on the label, sewn to the tongue. Fifteen. Mr. Jenkins had the same size feet as Mongo, but were his boots Timberlands? Riley gingerly extracted one boot out of the box and let, read the label, stamped into the side of the heel. Eddie Bauer. He eased the boot back into the box inside. It was nearly one o'clock. School would be over in two hours, and he didn't have a single piece of evidence. Or did he? He quickly texted Mongo. Where do you store your boots at night? Mongo texted right back. In my room. Not the answer Riley was looking for. But then he saw the bubble and dots letting him know that Mongo wasn't done texting. His second message finally blooped onto the screen. Unless they're wet. Then mom makes us put them on the porch. Yes, Riley thought. He hurried away from Mr. Jenkins's house slipped through the fence and went back into school. He needed to talk to Steve Duffy. The class change bell rang. Riley strolled over to where he knew Duffy had his locker. What are you doing here, loser? Duffy asked when he swaggered up the hallway to grab what he needed for his next class. I think you're lying, Riley told him. No way you scored a 100 on your makeup history quiz. Ha, said Duffy, digging a sheet of paper out of his notebook. Read it and weep. The librarian graded it for Mrs. Henkin, see? 100% nailed all four multiple choice questions. Riley glanced at the exam sheet. Up in the right-hand corner, he saw the 100 circled in red. The librarian had also added a smiley face. Riley checked out the first question. One, who was president at the start of World War II? A, Harry Truman, B, Dwight D. Eisenhower, C, Franklin D. Roosevelt, D, none of the above. Duffy, of course, had circled the correct answer, C. He'd answered the other three questions correctly, too. Riley handed the quiz back to Duffy and didn't say another word. He and Mongo needed to go see Mr. Ball, because Riley Mack knew who had written Fart in the Snow and why. So that's the end of the story. Uh, if you think you know what happened or who did it, uh, or even if you don't and you want to see what happened, especially if you don't and you want to see what happened, um, go to the next video, The Solution. Again, it's called Snow Devil Solution. So let me know what you think. Bye.